Hey everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to present to you a discussion on the topic of speciation. You know, when you think about speciation, this is an attempt to answer the mystery of mysteries, as Charles Darwin would have put it. In other words, how do new species come to be on the planet Earth? In other words, how can you create from one species two different species? And so this has been regarded as being something that's at times controversial because it appears, you know, to a human being who's walking around for just a short period of time that it doesn't look like organisms are really capable of changing. And even if you studied uh, population evolution, you might be able to detect over the course of a couple of decades, uh, over generations of time, allele frequencies changing. But has anyone ever witnessed a change of a species, in other words, the creation of new species. And so this is what we're going to be talking about today. So let's jump right into this most important conversation. And so indeed, the process of speciation creates new species. It's, it's the genesis of how biological species arise. And so how does it happen? How does it work? Well, you, it's nothing different than what we already understand about the mechanism of evolution, which is Evolution can occur when there's a violation of Hardy-Weinberg's genetic equilibrium, i.e. if there's a, a, ma a major drift event or if there's some selective pressure. That's known as microevolution. But if you can extrapolate that and look at this over a long period of time, that results in macroevolution, in other words, the creation of new species. But there's a few particulars that I'd like to add today. So first picture that I want to draw your attention to is Darwin's 14 finches different species of finch living on various islands in the Pacific, in the Galapagos archipelago. And so Darwin initially wasn't overwhelmed by the fact that there were a lot of different species because to him, he didn't even realize that a lot of these birds were finches. As it turns out, they looked so different morphologically that he didn't even know that he was dealing with finch in the first place. He thought they were like crows or blackbirds and, and, and wrens, that kind of thing. But as it turns out, these are all different species and they're occupying different habitats on the islands. So that's a little foreshadow of how speciation might occur in one way. So I want to tell you that there's two basic principles of how a species can uh, form into two. And that is, if you look at it, instead of animals, you know, we're, we, we could talk about birds or bacteria or fungi, anything. So if you look at this original population, this one species of like conifers right here, one of the main mechanisms of how we believe a population can speciate into two separate species. Now, the fact that these are light green, these are dark green, <clears throat> is not the point. This is just showing that this is a different species than this, meaning that they don't or they aren't able to reproduce. So that's most important. When we talk about two different species, we're talking about there's a reproductive barrier between those populations. And so we believe, and I'll go into detail of this in a moment, we believe that one of the driving forces that will cause speciation is that members of a population, in this case trees, can be separated. Now I know that seems a little absurd for a plant, which is indeed planted in one area, but the thing is, the earth is capable of quite remarkable change. Like, for example, you may not see it, but there could be a creek right in here in the forest. And then that could build up into a river, and then that could actually, over thousands and I dare say millions of years, form a canyon. And then, indeed, these members are geographically isolated or geographically separated. And so that in and of itself doesn't make a new species, but it's the beginning of the speciation process known as allopatric speciation. That's a cool term. If you think about it, patrica is sort of uh, a word meaning patriot or homeland, and allo means other, so another homeland. So in other words, they've been geographically isolated. And then check out the other mechanism of speciation. This other mechanism of speciation is kind of cool. Members of the population are not geographically isolated, but yet somehow a new species arises. In other words, these, these trees do not reproduce back with the original parental population in the same area, in the same area, mind you. So we call that sim, which is a similar homeland. So 
That's interesting. So there's two ways. You can become geographically isolated, which then leads to speciation, or you could speciate within the same area. And so today's conversation is about these two events and how they occur. And so one of the things about this geographic <coughs> isolation or geographic barrier is that it's not just a river, not just a canyon, but it could even be a mountain range. Like for example, here in Africa, you can look here and you can see that this is I don't know if you knew this, but there are some pretty high mountains over here separating what is Central Africa and the Congo and the tropical rainforest to this East Africa over here, which is more savanna over here in like in Ethiopia, for example. Now, what's fascinating is that the geographic uh, mountain range uh, affects the environment. Like, for example, like rain, it rains a lot here, but then it's a little bit of a rain shadow. When the water goes up in these high elevations, it snows, and then it's rather arid over here on the east side. So much so that it doesn't support a jungle. Over here, it's just grassland with a scattering of trees that we like to call savanna. What's interesting is we believe, biologists believe, that populations were separated by these mountain ranges. So over a long period of time, can you imagine this? Even though mountains arise very slowly, they can actually form a geographic barrier to members. Like what I'm getting at is that some of the members of the population stayed on this side, the west side, and some were over here on the east side. But what's interesting is I mentioned this environment is very different than this environment. This area over here, if I can dramatize this, is, is jungle. And then over here, it's kind of grassland with a few trees. Um, if you know a little bit about human evolution, or the study of human evolution or uh, anthropology, you'll know that we believe strongly that he, the humans came from this particular area. And, and it's, it's not a coincidence that this area is a savanna. And perhaps our distant ancestors were once tree-dwelling organisms, something like a monkey of some sort, that was able to swing from vine to vine in, these, in the trees of the, of the rainforest, but felt the need and, and, and were compelled to come down out of the trees because the trees are so distant from one another and perhaps that led to uh, the organism being more bipedal or, or standing upright as a result of that habitat change. So remarkably, um, this could have resulted in the speciation that formed humanity. Quite remarkable. So we're talking about a geographic barrier. And so what kind of geographic barriers? It could be mountains, and we mentioned before there could be rivers that form canyons, but it could also be something uh, like, for example, islands are geographically isolated from each other by water, and they could even be geographically isolated from the mainland. For example, in the Galapagos Islands, there's thousands of kilometers that separate the Galapagos from Ecuador. So something uh, causes uh, individuals, like for example, when organisms come over to the Galapagos Islands and they immigrate there, they become they're sort of remote and they become geographically isolated. I know what you're thinking, but it's like these trips are often one way. It's like it's they're lucky to make it there alive in the first place. So it's not like a plane trip where you fly to Hawaii and then you get a round trip ticket and you come back. Basically, if you're if you can make it to the Galapagos Islands, you're pretty much going to stay there and then you're geographically isolated from the original population. Like for example, the Grand Canyon. Now I, I can't think of a larger canyon, but this is formed by the Colorado River. And what's interesting about it is there's been studies done on these squirrel. Do you see here? This is on the north rim and the southern rim. Now, to me, maybe to you, they look like they're the same species. I, I don't know. I feel lucky to even know that it is a squirrel for one thing. But it turns out that they're two different species. And you're like, come on, squirrels. I know that you can reproduce. But they don't. And you're like, the reason they don't, sure, they are separated by the big canyon. But even if you were to grab these squirrels and bag them and drive them around to the other side and you put them in the same range, they just won't reproduce. There's probably some sort of prezygotic barrier that's preventing. They don't like each other's behavior. And so the question before us is, why does geographic isolation lead to allopatric speciation? Now, what, what's happening? Here's my question sort of rhetorically. What's happening on the north rim that's not happening on the, on the southern rim, and what is happening here that's happening here. But something is driving a wedge between them. And I think you might know. So 
the likelihood of allopatric speciation <clears throat> increases when the population that's immigrating to a new area, like over the mountain or to a different island, when it's really a small population. And you might know the answer to that. It's, the reason is because of genetic drift. When the population size becomes low, there's a higher likelihood that the allele frequencies will uh, deviate from what is expected. You can't, br you can't expect to bring every representative allele from the original population to a new place. So right out of the gate, you're going to get a ma massive microevolutionary event in just a few generations. And then what further exacerbates the difference between the two populations, <coughs> excuse me, is that selection acts everywhere. It doesn't just act on an island or it doesn't just act in the homeland. But when the environment is different, selection takes on different pressures. And so what is the selective pressure on an, uh, one island may be different from another. And so that will also grossly affect the allele frequency. And so you get massive microevolution occurring when members of a population become separated allopatrically and geographically isolated. And the truth is, <clears throat> when populations become isolated, sometimes they simply perish in that new environment. that They're just not suited for it. <clears throat> so that could happen. So an um, example of this is, like for example, if this gold line represents a population that's sort of on the move, <clears throat> And it's, it's going along, it's traveling, <clears throat> it's migrating toward a mountain. And just randomly, some, <clears throat> some of the members of the population, excuse me, <clears throat> <clears throat> some of the members of the population go on one side of the mountain and some on the other side of the mountain. So they become geographically isolated. <clears throat> and as they become geographically isolated, what's interesting, I could, I could sort of like, you know, make this sort of ridiculous, but I could say that on one side of the mountain, there's a lot of vegetation, and on the other side, there's not. And again, this is the kind of thing that can happen. We, we're familiar with this living in California. Like, for example, the western slope of the Sierra Nevada gets a lot of uh, moisture. But then on the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada, it's very dry and arid. If, you, if you've ever snow skied at Lake Tahoe, you, you're able to get up to these tall mountains and notice that over here there's... It's a boreal forest, and over here it's a desert. It's quite remarkable. So it's interesting if a population become, can become allopatrically separated like this. The question is, is natural selection going to be acting differently on these populations? And the answer is yes. And the, big, the bigger question is, can they still interbreed when they come back together around the mountain? And so when they come back together and they're in similar areas, when they live in sympatry in the same area, if they are able to still breed with one another, then they're still the same species. But if something is preventing them, notice over here the green and the gold, if something's preventing them, some sort of reproductive barrier, then indeed we went from one species, and I'll just call it out, we went from one species to two species. And here we just had some change and some change, but ultimately they didn't change significantly and they're still able to reproduce. So the question comes, you know, how se severe is this geographic barrier? How much time are we talking about? Has anyone really studied this? And so there's a great example of organisms that have been studied at the, from the University of California, Berkeley. And you know, the, the funny thing about this is that it's such a modest organism. It's a little tiny salamander. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I have some pictures coming in a moment. But there's this population of salamanders that live up here in Oregon. And you remember how I said that in the previous slide they came down and they hit a mountain and some of them went this way and some of them went this way. Well, a mountain can be a formidable obstacle, but so can a valley. So the Central Valley of California uh, is, is such a geographic barrier. And so these salamanders are coming down into California. So they're, they're, they're immigrating into California. Now, ju just to keep things real, this is not, this is a far distance. Like if you've ever, if you had to walk this or bike this or even in a car ride, it takes several hours. We're not talking about one salamander or even a group of them. This is over generations of salamanders migrating to, to California. Some of the population of salamanders came down, and this is, there are many of them coming down like this. Some of them came over here along the coast of California, 
like this, and we know this because we, we can capture them. And some of them come, came over here on the western slope of the Sierra Nevada. And so this took many, 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 many years, maybe hundreds of years, for these salamanders to move along. And so as the populations became geographically isolated, different things start to occur. Natural selection occurs differently on this side than on this side. And in addition to that, maybe new mutations are starting to arise in these populations, and mutations are happening over on this side. They're random. And maybe what is a mutation uh, it has a benefit over here is would be a detriment over on this side. And so selection, mutation, isolation. The question before us is when they come meet up together in L.A., is will they be able to reproduce? Because if they are able to reproduce, they're still the same species, and if they cannot, then they are two different species. And so this is known as a ring, because it, it's sort of a ring around Central Valley. So in a ring species, the populations get distributed around some sort of geographic barrier. Indeed, this is the Central Valley. And when they come together, the question is, can they interbreed? And so here's a picture of the original population. Now, they may not all look exactly like this, but there is variation in the population. And variation, as you may know, comes through just random mutations. And it's like here nor there. So there's variation. So do you notice here in the purple, there's populations migrating down? And then over here on the, wet, on the western uh, coast of California, down in Monterey, in this area down here, do you notice the, the <clears throat> salamander is kind of a bright orange color? And then over here, look at this, over on, the, on uh, the southern part of the Sierra Nevada, it's like totally different. It's black with yellow spots. Now, obviously, there's two different selection pressures going on. Scientists at Cal feel that the reason that this coloration is doing really well over here is that it's camouflage. It seems to blend into the vegetation. And you're like, this bright orange one, this is a little bit of a mystery. This doesn't really camouflage. It's actually kind of showy. It's, it's so showy that it might be some sort of um, warning coloration. In other words, that it's packing some kind of poison. But in fact, the salamander doesn't produce it. But indeed, it mimics a poisonous newt that's kind of reddish in coloration. And so therefore, it survives better because of mimicry. So the question is, <coughs> excuse me, when they come together, are they able to interbreed in the ring species? This is a picture of that Monterey salamander that I was telling you that's bright coloration. To me that would intimidate me, although it doesn't have any poison. So these California pioneers, if you will, split into a chain of interbreeding populations along the, the coast and along the, uh, the inland mountains of the Sierra Nevada. So they formed a ring around the Central Valley. And so where they came together um, is the question of whether or not do they interbreed or do they not interbreed. And so the populations, as it turns out, do not interbreed. And so we can see a great example in salamanders of allopatric speciation. So they appear to be two different species. So that's kind of neat. Now, if you take that, you know, like, okay, so that's how two species. But you started this presenta presentation by talking about 14 different species of finch. How does that happen? How do you go from two to 14? Well, you just keep keep the allopatric speciation going. In other words, if birds go over to Santa Cruz and they go over to Isabella and they go over to Fernandina and they keep moving from island to island, these islands, uh, Santa Maria is different than uh, Costa, uh, Santa Cruz. And so you get different habitats. And so what you call this is flurries. In other words, repeated waves of allopatric speciation that genetic drift, founder effect, natural selection working differently. And then when you go over to these different islands, you know, things are really different. Like the food may be different. It might require different beaks. Uh, there may be a, a different predator. You may have to co-evolve with other biological organisms putting pressure on you. There might be temporal sorts of things. There might be a, a predator that might be trying to get you, and so you tend to stay up later or feed later. And so you start doing things differently behaviorally. New mutations arise. Generations after generations, the populations deviate so far apart from one another that even if they were to come back in the same area, like those salamanders, they still wouldn't be able to reproduce with one another. So I really like this diagram.
it shows that you know it's sort of an inverse of going uh, from Ecuador west, but this is going in an easterly direction. But once a population becomes geographically isolated, that's already an example of genetic drift, founder effect. So there's probably a big microevolution, and and you have to think that this environment right here is a little bit different than I could just you know, play it around. It's different environment than where they came from, and so natural selections occurring differently. And so there's a lot of different pressures, and then mutations arise generation after generation, and changes start to occur over time significantly to the fact that B is a new species. It doesn't reproduce with A anymore, not simply because it's geographically isolated, because if you were to bag it and put it over here, there would be some sort of reproductive barrier. And then this continues. This is what we mean by, by uh, many allopatric speciations. What we call this is from one ancestral species radiating out like this and branching into 14 different species. What we call this is adaptive radiation, sort of like the sun that radiates outward. Or you could think of it's like a tree branching from one ancestral common ground finch to the 14 different species that we see today presently on the Galapagos Islands. So this is how we believe allopatric speciation occurs. Geographic isolation, drift, natural selection, mutation, many years, and then ultimately reproductive isolation. And so this can happen on the Galapagos Islands, and we know it uh, pretty confidently because these are young islands. They were volcanic. They were, there was nothing living here. It's an example of primary succession. Everything that is living on the Galapagos Islands immigrated there. But how do you account for the fact that there's new species there? They must have evolved on the Galapagos Islands after the origin of the Earth and after those original populations. And so new species can appear on the face of the Earth. And so here's a kind of a cartoon drawing of what I was talking about, like when organisms make it over to an island and become geographically isolated. Obviously, the allele frequencies are going to change because of founder effect, and maybe it'll become fixed. Uh, we've seen this in the lab when, when we study uh, genetic drift. Sometimes the allele frequencies will be fixed. And so microevolution, natural selection. It's not just the Galapagos Islands. We see this on the on Hawaiian islands as well. You know, there's a, these are maybe even more popular. They're beautiful islands, 3,500 miles away from the continent. And so these started off as volcanic islands, nothing living on here. And so there are species now on Hawaii that are found nowhere else in the world. So they must have evolved there. They must have speciated while they were on the Hawaiian islands. And so you're like, wait a minute. So every island there's speciation. Not every island. Uh, the islands have to be kind of remote, and there must be what helps is if there's the environments are different on those islands, which encourages the, the, the divergence between the populations. And so because of the fact that there's many islands, you can get multiple allopatric speciation, and so you get a lot of adaptive radiation. Now, you might be thinking, well, I, you know, I've been to Florida, I've been to southern Florida, and there's, there's so many islands, they call this the Florida Keys, that you can actually build a highway and some bridges between the islands. You're like, maybe this is an area where there's tons of speciation, lots of adaptive radiation. I see all of the islands. But in fact, when we look on these islands, we don't see a lot of speciation. That might be, why do you suppose? Maybe the islands are similar. Maybe they're close enough to one another that populations can go back and forth, that there's, there's more gene flow between the populations. And so there's no reproductive isolation that occurs as a result of that. And so the second type of speciation is, is a rather interesting one. Remember, we've been talking about allopatric speciation. This is sympatric in the same area. How can this happen? Well, this is less to do with... Um, organisms leaving because they're in the same area, but how organisms reproduce, they need to produce gametes. And the way they reproduce gametes, as you recall, you know this, they, they undergo the process of meiosis. And meiosis is simply the separation of chromosomes into, into daughter haploid cells. Now that doesn't always occur perfectly. Sometimes you can have 
more chromosomes going to one gamete and therefore less in the other one. And that's called non-disjunction when the chromosomes, the homologous chromosomes do not segregate properly. And that results in abnormal chromosome number in the gametes, known as aneuploidy. And if those gametes were to fuse together, they, it creates an abnormal chromosome number. And so normally animals can't really handle abnormal chromosome numbers unless it's just one or one more, one less. But as it turns out, this sympatric speciation is mostly with plants because as it turns out, there's meiotic errors that occur in the formation of pollen and eggs in plants which have abnormal chromosome numbers and sometimes the pollen and egg will fuse together and create a larger or smaller chromosome number than the original plant and therefore it is not able to back reproduce with the original parent population but it is able to self-pollinate and thus it creates a whole new species as a result of it being polyploidy many many different chromosomes uh, or, or abnormal chromosome number one of the very first scientists was this <clears throat> botanist in the turn of the century, Hugo de Vries, you may recall him from a previous discussion, he was growing these primrose plants and he noticed that right in the middle of the garden there was a plant that didn't want to breed. He kept crossing the pollen with the original plants and it never produced a seed. But when he self-pollinated it, it did reproduce and form seeds. And it's like, wow, it doesn't cross-pollinate, but it does self-pollinates. It, it's a new species. It's reproductively isolated. Now, Hugo didn't know why. He speculated that he, he thought it might have been some kind of mutation, but he was wrong. It was actually an example of non-disjunction and polyploidy in these plants, which led to, in the same garden, this is what we mean by sympatric, a speciation event. So they, they were not geographically isolated. So it wasn't having to do with natural selection. It was having to do with a mistake in the formation of the gametes. And so sympatric speciation in the same area, so these are like the primrose, in the same area a meiotic of, uh, mistake occurs in the same area and therefore they do not reproduce with other members of the population. They just self-reproduce with one another and therefore new species can uh, arise. Now what's fascinating is since, since the 1900s, plant biologists have been playing around with this. You know, like. We, we all love our fruit, but sometimes we have problems with our fruit. Like, for example, sometimes we don't like the peach because it's kind of furry or it has too much juice. Or we like uh, and we love an apricot, but sometimes it's that fuzz makes us have the chills or something. And um, we like a plum, but it's like plum and apricot are two different species. You won't be able to transfer pollen and have them create an offspring. But what's interesting is we could use some chemicals that while the cells are producing their gametes and pollen can make the chromosomes, they interfere with the spindle fiber and make the chromosomes move around sort of free willy. And then sometimes they form uh, the, the pollen and the egg and we can get them to fertilize and then a whole new hybrid plant is formed. And like in this case, this is a, you may recognize it, this is a pluot. It's kind of a blend between an apricot and a plum. So it has sort of the better qualities of both. And you can get things like grapples as a result of this. Now, these are not uh, per se uh, capable of fertilizing with a plum or with a apricot. So they're considered to be a, a human-generated hybrid new species. So in summary, uh, populations could become geographically isolated. Look at that. Like these fish are now isolated from one another and environments are different, new species form, reproductive isolation. Then sometimes new species form in the same area, sympatrically. And so, little discussion briefly about how long this takes. It takes a long time for speciation, but it really depends on the organism. Because if you're talking about little organisms like microscopic bacteria, speciation events can occur rather rapidly because the generation time is short and you can get different mutation rates, increased diversity, so it can happen rather rapidly, but larger organisms it takes a long time. And the fossil record sort of supports this idea that we see sort of these, you know, divergence in this sort of a gradual diversification of one population into two separate species.
So we see this over a long period of time in the fossil record. Well, the fossil records also supports the fact that sometimes species stay the same for a long, long period of time without very little change at all. And sometimes there's slow change. And so sometimes we see or populations stay in the same for a long period of time and then suddenly there's a big abrupt change and then new species arrive. So they, it could either be gradual or what we call like punctuated. In other words, it stays the same for a long period of time and then perhaps some major, like a tsunami or a big volcano or something traumatic, like a like I don't know, a huge earthquake or some sort of major environmental firestorm caused causes a major environmental change and therefore spurs on rapid speciation. So the evidence supports the fact that speciation can be gradual, but it can also be punctuated. And, and the fact that things stay consistent for a long period of time sort of supports the idea of stabilizing selection, that we see organisms pretty much unchanged for a long period of time, staying the same. For example, no extreme forms. But then suddenly the environment changes and, and you see a major shift. Now natural selection doesn't in it itself mean a new species is forming, but it, but it leads to speciation. And so you can see here, uh, stabilizing selection reduces the extremes and it sort of goes middle of the road. So, it could, so the fossil record sort of suggestive of the fact that there's long periods of time where there's no change, but you cannot see it when you look at just fossils, you know, we don't know when you look at a fossil, maybe behavior has been changing or maybe some internal biochemistry has been changing during that time. It's hard to, it's hard to study uh, things that have been living millions of years ago. So in the end, we could say, you know, the, the final question that we have about this is if we believe, and it's not even a matter of belief, we, we understand that life is like a tree. We understand that all living things are like the tips of the branches that have descended from a common ancestry. So descent with modification from an original uh, population. And this is what Charles Darwin, I put this next to the tree, this is his original vision that he had in his, in his journal that he thought that it was like a tree of life. So that life is a continuum from its earliest forms and the DNA has been passing on throughout our children till this day. And so what's interesting is we believe that life on the earth occurred for the first time around three and a half billion years ago. It's a long time ago. We believe it might have occurred in the ocean. As the, the, the land at this time was kind of brutal. It's very, very, very hot. There's a lot of ultraviolet light. So we believe that perhaps life originated the first cell in the oceans of the earth. And very briefly, there were two scientists in the 1950s, funny, right around the time of Jim Watson and Francis Crick studying the structure of DNA, but Stanley Miller and Harold Urey did a, a very simple experiment, but somewhat famous, is that they tried to simulate what the Earth might have looked like three and a half billion years ago. What were the conditions that made the first cell? In other words, the leap from non-life to life. So perhaps the oceans were hot because of the the the, the temperature of the earth still hadn't cooled yet and there was steam rising in the atmosphere. So this represents, these are glass tubes, represents the atmosphere. Maybe methane gas, pneumonia, uh, or I'm sorry, ammonia, hydrogen, methane gas, and carbon dioxide. Maybe these were the gases that were present. Notice not a lot of oxygen because photosynthesis is really the mechanism of producing a lot of oxygen gas. And then when the earth cooled, the gases condensed and it formed down. And now this is not just pure distilled water. Their hypothesis in this experiment was maybe there is organic molecules in the ocean. <coughs> maybe there were amino acids here. And we could do this experiment and generate amino acids and nucleotides and simple sugars. It's simply like taking these beginning molecules and breaking them up and forming organic simple monomers. And so we believe, this is a picture of, of Stanley Miller here in the lab today, we believe that perhaps amino acids and organic molecules were created spontaneously in the earth and then those eventually formed polymers like proteins and then phospholipids formed which formed the cell membrane and then nucleotides formed 
and then those formed poly polynucleotides, and then we have nucleic acids surrounded by a membrane, water diffusing across that sounds a lot like a cell. And so perhaps this is the origin of life, that it occurred spontaneously on the earth. But maybe it was something to do, you need a source of energy to, and, and in the previous diagram, the source of energy is being sparked, like for example, lightning in the sky is a great source of energy to break molecules up. But maybe the source of energy could be submerged volcanoes under the water or deep sea vents that creates a lot of energy and maybe that hot water broke molecules apart and formed amino acids and nucleotides. Maybe, and I know this seems far-fetched, maybe organic molecules like amino acids and nucleotides actually landed on the earth from outside of the earth. In other words, extraterrestrial organic molecules in the form of meteors arrived and so the earth was indeed seeded with the organic molecules that make us up today. <coughs> Incredible. And so finally, <clears throat> our tree of life from so simple a beginning, uh, <clears throat> endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have <clears throat> are being evolved. And so Charles Darwin gave us this, this um, this notion and there's grandeur in this view of life you know <clears throat> here's a beautiful picture of a redwood tree and I think it represents uh, a good place to sort of finish this slideshow because it's such a wonderful organism but then again so is every other creature that's ever lived on the earth or ever will live on the earth because new species are continuing to evolve and species go extinct and so this is a dynamic earth and we're just here for a short period of time and I'm glad you're here with me trying to understand and more importantly enjoy these great mysteries of biological sciences. So I believe Charles Darwin's view of, of the creation of life uh, and the evolution of life support not in sort of a anti-religious perspective, but I think provide a religious perspective and context for the study of biological sciences. I hope you enjoyed the slideshow. Thanks for watching.